Mr. Jordan, president of the Philadelphia Federation of Teachers. Okay, and why are you here today? I'm here because I believe that it's so important to make sure that the public understands that much too much money is being spent on the prison system. In fact, the prison system is costing the taxpayers more money than it's costing them to educate children in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And so when you're saying that money is being taken from the education system and being put towards the expansion of prisons, I mean, don't we have to get the criminals off the street? Why would we not uh, want to put money to expand prisons? Well, it seems to me that it's much better to make sure that we have an educated population and when people are educated and have the skills to become employed, that they're not going to uh, run the risk of doing something illegal in order to uh, get money or their needs. They'll be able to become productive citizens. What, is that, what does that do to the community when you drain the resources and you put them towards the after effect of crime, how does that affect our neighborhoods? It means that uh, our neighborhoods are uh, destroyed. That's what it means when you don't educate people who are able to uh, become taxpaying citizens who will be able to uh, purchase homes and live in our city. It means that we are not we are losing a tax base and we're losing the educated, productive citizens, and uh, we really are uh, harming the city. Well, it, it almost sounds, if, if I may be blunt, it almost sounds like taking money away from education, away from social programs, it almost seems like there's a cause and effect. Like the money taken away is causing some of the things that they want to incarcerate people for. Oh, you're absolutely right. There is a cause and effect. You know, when you invest in people, you get that investment back. When you disinvest, you pay for that too. Hey, uh, your full name? Dana Lomax Williams. And what organization are you affiliated with? HRC, Human Rights Coalition. Okay, Dana. And why are you here today? Well, I am a former inmate, Muncie. Um, I was incarcerated for four years, and during that four years, I was held in solitary confinement because I chose to speak out against the torture and abuse that was going on within the compound. And when I did that, it caused my release to be delayed two years. And so, being on both sides of the wall, you were on that side, now you're on this side, and you're involved in, in civic engagement, you know, how has that been for you? Have, you? have you seen any effects, positive effects from the work you've done? Actually, I have. Actually, I started advocating while I was within the walls because I came in contact with and had cellies that were lifers, long-termers, and they couldn't speak out. So what compelled me to speak out is I figured I was leaving. I was maxing, so I didn't have anything to lose. So that compelled me to speak out for those who was in fear of retaliation. So I took a stand. And what can we do um, when you talk about the fear of people that are locked up from retaliation from the, the guards, from the uh, warden, the prison administration, how can we galvanize that energy that's on, on the other side of the wall? What can we do to, get in, to engage them? Well, actually, one thing I think is extremely imperative is family support. Because when you have a family that's behind you, that's making phone calls, signing a petition, actively involved, it causes the institution to think twice about what was going on with you. But family involvement is, is so, I can't express how important family involvement is. And so you have some inmates that don't have any family. So therefore, that's when different organizations such as HRC, Decarcerate Pennsylvania, and other organizations, that's our job to step in and be their advocate. So what do we do about the folks coming out? Um, how do we engage? How do we get their attention to get more empowered to be part of this work? Well, what I've done is I created my own database and I communicate with a lot of women, primarily inmates because I was in Muncie. Um, so what's important is when they come out, what I do is I give them my, I gave a lot of them my information while I was on, while I was inside. So when they get out, I usually know when they get out, we communicate, we talk, and when they get out, I connect with them and let them know, look, you can't forget what you've been through. How dare you forget because you are what you've been through. You still have a responsibility to stand up 
for what you've been through and for the other women that's within. So I connect with them, have them come down. You know, uh, we're in dire need of volunteers. I'm at, at the organization HRC, so I think that's important because once they're involved, it, it, it keeps them mindful of what they've been through. And also it causes them to feel like they're part of and making a difference. So I think that is so imperative. Okay. Now I understand, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, and you can give me your, your data, out of 1.5 million people, residents, citizens of Philadelphia, I'm hearing that over 200 to 300,000 of that particular number are folks that have a criminal history. Um, what's your comment on that? Through my experience, because I have family members also and other loved ones, friends, um, I would say that is about right, if not more, if not more. You know what I mean? And I don't think prison is not a form of rehabilitation. Not at all. That's not the answer. Prison is not, not the answer. You have, you have to implement certain programs. Okay, you have to stop taking away from the community to build the prisons. Because obviously that's not the answer. You're building more cages instead of providing certain resources to help the people that need help become self-sufficient. So when you locked up, I mean, they then took away educational programs within the institution and in the, in the courses that do do have you have to pay for them so if you have an inmate that's indigent okay they have no form of uh, financial support how are they supposed to educate themselves so when they come out they're able to be productive so we need certain programs uh, uh, on the outside that help them you know and remove certain barriers that were prohibiting them to becoming self-sufficient and, and I think I, what I hear you saying is prevention you know, we have all these prisons, and, and, and from my understanding, there's a lot of prison expansion going on. And if we can prevent folks from going down that road, catch them at a young age, when they're at risk. Um, what ideas, now you mentioned some of the things, some of the programs. Do you have any specifics of uh, prevention? How do we keep folks from going down this road? Well, first of all, when they're young, it starts when they're young. Okay, they have to, it's important that they have stability. It's important that they have structure. It's important that they have a role model, a mentor, perhaps join, you know, I feel for single parents, male and female, because they have to work. So we need state uh, funded uh, organizations to take up that idle time. A lot of children, when they get home from school, they're home by themselves for uh, a significant amount of time. So we need, you know, we need certain points. We need the wide back. We need the, the, the 20. My name is Romika Williams. The organization that you're representing today? I'm with the Youth Arts Self Empowerment Project, but I'm also with the Carcerate PA. And why are you here today? I'm the representative for the people. I will be the one prosecuting Governor Corbett and John Wetzel, charging them with charges that they're doing to our community. And 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 specifically, what are they doing to the community? Um, they locking our our member are like our, our neighbors our families our friends up giving them life without parole giving our kids our juveniles youth life without parole the possibility of parole and not even looking at 50 years later how different they, that he will be like now, now these folks broke the law now what do we do with the folk, the folks that are breaking the law if we don't lock them up I'm not saying that if they do something they shouldn't have consequences because I'm just saying that they shouldn't give a juvenile life without the possibility of parole. Because they're going to be totally different years from now. And like they're not looking at that. You get what I'm saying? They don't understand that um, breaking up a family like hurts people. You get what I'm saying? They don't understand um, like you, you doing all this type of stuff to the community, how it's affecting the community as well. Like, Throwing people in jail is not is is not um, solving the problem. You get what I'm saying? We need rehabilitation. We need stuff for these people to come home to. Now I see a, a pretty good sized crowd uh, developing today. Um, what do you say to your friends, your peers? How do you get them more involved? Well, my peers is here. My organization, we're here, and we volunteering. We doing everything possible, like to make make this stuff work out here. You get what I'm saying? Like, to just do what we gotta do for our communities because it starts with us. Now, I'm, I'm just an everyday Joe walking down the street. Why would I stop and, and, and pay attention to what's going on? How does this affect me? 
it affects you because they're arresting the people in our communities. We, you can't tell me no one has a family member that's thrown in jail. It affects everyone. You get what I'm saying? It, it, it starts with the community because once we unite, we will have that lead. You know what I'm saying? We, we choose who we get to um, go into the office, the community. So once we unite, we'll have a good lead. My name is Maylisa Gamble, and I'm here to stand with Decarcerate, and I represent uh, the Returning Citizens Voter Movement. I am also uh, formerly incarcerated, and I would like to put both of these men on trial equally because conspiracy is nine-tenths of the law. What we need to do right now is talk about the programs that they're cutting on the inside, and when the men and women come home, there are no programs on the outside. So what do you got? You want to build more jails. The people still coming home to the community. The people are still coming home to the community. I say stop them both right now. Tom Corbett won by 350,000 votes. In the city of Philadelphia alone, there are 400,000 formerly incarcerated and convicted people. If one of these, one third of these people would have gone out and voted with the rest of the community, see you later, bye. See you later, bye. There cannot be another election in the city of Philadelphia or the state of Pennsylvania where Tom Corbett wins an election. That's right. The numbers that I just read to you guys or stated to you guys are for Philadelphia alone. They are not for the rest of the surrounding counties. So imagine, imagine. I sat down with John Wexler and he wanted to know what type of programs were we gonna do, what the Returning Citizens Voter Movement gonna do. Well, we're gonna educate and we're gonna register. We're gonna empower and we're gonna engage. Did everybody hear what I said? Yeah. So there's no more Tom Corbett coming up. I'm working hard with my team right now. They trying to suppress the vote with the ID. That ain't gonna happen either. Not on my watch. I stand with the carcerate today and every day. And I'm not feeling very well right now, but I wanted to get up because I was like, damn, they out there sitting on the front line and I'm laying in here in bed. So I said, I'm getting up today. My family members said, I don't think you should do that. I said, well, if they going out there and they going to stand on the front row, I'm going out there with them. No more. No more. No more. That's it. They both go to jail. They both go to jail. The time is now to make a change. Right now. Tell your friends and tell your family and tell your foe. The time is right now for Corbin and Wexler to get their asses out of here. Testimony. Very passionate. Representative Wood. Representative Amika, we've had testimony on a number of the charges that have been brought against these defendants. I'd like you to charge the jury and ask them to decide on the charge on the charges that have been testi testified on against. Them. <laughs> well, I'm gonna ask the jury. From just hearing them, the witness testified. Is he guilty or not guilty? Guilty! Is he guilty or not guilty? Guilty! One more time. Is he guilty or not guilty? Guilty! Very different, different, different issues and concerns. I'm finding so, I'm finding so many, so many different mental
different mentality today. It seems hard. It seems it seems challenging. I don't say hard because the only thing hard is the concrete that we walk on. Everything else is a challenge. Else is a challenge. Um, um, so so I'm ready. I'm ready for this challenge.